Good afternoon and welcome again to the 2022 annual Sacred Trust Talks and book signing event presented by the Foundation, Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park. We are pleased to collaborate with the Foundation to invite renowned Civil War historians, authors, National Park Service rangers, licensed battlefield guides and experts to participate in the Sacred Trust Talks and provide their unique perspectives. Our next speaker, Mr. Stephen T. Fawn, will discuss how the U.S. military forces were on the ascension following the dramatic victories at Gettysburg, Vicksburg, and Tullahoma by July 1863. In the Western Theater, the armies of the Cumberland and Ohio were tasked with delivering the final death blow to the Confederacy with offensives into East Tennessee and Georgia. Camp Nelson, a massive U.S. Army supply depot in central Kentucky, fueled the armies who aimed to end the war by year's end. Stephen T. Fawn is a park ranger and serves as the Chief of Interpretation at Camp Nelson National Monument in Nicholasville, Kentucky, the 418th unit of the National Park Service. He recently served as the historian for the Civil War Defenses of Washington, D.C., and has worked at several National Park Service sites, including Gettysburg, Stones River, Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers National Monument, and we are so delighted to have him here with us today. So please join me in welcoming Steve Fon. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to represent the National Park Service and, as Chris mentioned, one of the newest units of the National Park Service Camp Nelson National Monument in central Kentucky. And I'll be speaking about Camp Nelson and its role in 1863 and 1864, 65, even 1866. Um, but it's always a pleasure to come back to uh, Gettysburg National Military Park, especially for the battle anniversary. I was just talking to uh, John Heiser, the former historian here and librarian, that you know my MPS career started at Gettysburg in 2012 as an intern working in the Museum and Special Collections for Greg Adele. So blame him for all this, okay? <laughs> so as I mentioned, we're going to talk, and I, I, just, I call this Victory Summer 1863. And it's Camp Nelson, but it's really the two other field armies in the West that are often forgotten about when we talk about uh, the, the military campaigns that are occurring literally simultaneously in the summer of 1863. And this presentation was inspired by my graduate research at the uh, Min uh, excuse me, Middle Tennessee State University, uh, where I attended near Stones River National Battlefield. And I really focused on federal occupation and military operations in uh, Middle Tennessee, uh, all the way down to the Alabama border, and then around Southeast Tennessee, around Chickamauga, Chattanooga, and things like that. And it's quite interesting because I discovered how uh, inextricably linked uh, the campaigns of East and West were. So as Chris mentioned, you know, there's quite a uh, bit of momentum building for the federal armies and the Union war effort in 1863. And so, the introduction to this, I call it the finishing blow to the rebellion. And so the Union war effort was reinvigorated following the dramatic victories at Gettysburg on July 3rd and the capitulation of the Confederate garrison at Vicksburg on the Mississippi River on July 4th. Independence Day 1863 would not soon be forgotten. And I must mention, as Chris listed my biography, I worked at the Civil War Defenses of Washington, and I've been in and out of town all weekend on the battlefield and people keep on asking me, what was DC like during uh, the battle, um, the campaign in Gettysburg? Well, I just wanna mention that there were 36,000 federal soldiers in the defenses of Washington during the Gettysburg campaign, about 48 to 60 fortifications mounting over 500 artillery pieces. So who knows what would happen if General Meade got turned back here, but Lee would be running into the defenses of Washington. So back to this battle and what happens out west. The U.S. De uh, War Department, flushed with confidence, smelt blood, and believed the end of the rebellion was imminent. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton was ready to use the momentum created by the victories to crush final resistance and end the war. So campaigns and battles don't occur in a vacuum. Military operations, both small and large, impacted each other from the East End Theater to the West. Uh, their outcomes reverberated across the American landscape in the summer of 1863. He looked to the Western Theater, the massive swath of territory between the Mississippi River and the Appalachian Mountains to deliver 
and his words the finishing blow to the rebellion. There were major field armies in the theater, two of them that we will be discussing. The armies, uh, the Army of the Cumberland, the second largest field force behind the Army of the Potomac, and the recently reorganized Army of the Ohio. So Gettysburg, where we are at today. And finally, the capitulation of Vicksburg on the Mississippi River, the iconic Confederate stronghold. So I call this the Wild Wild West. <clears throat> and you can see there the theater from the Mississippi River. You can see on the western, uh, the left part of the screen there, all the way to the Appalachian Mountains and truly everything in between. And we'll be talking a lot about Kentucky and Middle Tennessee uh, throughout this program here. East meets West. And so Major, William, Major General William S. Rosecrans commanded the Army of the Cumberland. The force, numbering over 60,000 men, had been operating in Middle Tennessee since the Battle of Stones River in January 1863. Rosecrans, to the chagrin of the War Department and Army headquarters, spent months preparing for his next move. A grand offensive to drive the Confederate Army of Tennessee out of Middle Tennessee, uh, capturing Chattanooga, which was the critical railroad center depot and the gateway into Georgia. <clears throat> The other army in the region was under the command of Major General Ambrose E. Burnside, who was appointed to command the newly reorganized Department of the Ohio in March of 1863. And it was a massive department encompassing the states of Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and part of Kentucky east of the Tennessee River. His duties were complicated and immense, and he lacked the necessary troops to manage the large department. So you're going to see, I'm going to be going back and forth between the armies of the Cumberland and the Ohio. So I call this section the most brilliant and forgotten campaign of the Civil War, and you can see by this quote here. So Victory Summer 1863 featured Gettysburg and Vicksburg. There was a major omission, Tullahoma. General Rosecrans launched the Tullahoma campaign from his base of operations at Murfreesboro and the surrounding area on June 24th, 1863. Think about that date. Four days prior to George Meade's ascension to command of the Army of the Potomac and in, and in the midst of U.S. Grant's siege of Vicksburg, the campaign consisted of rapid movements and feints against Brigadier, I mean, excuse me, General Braxton Bragg's entrenched army, the Bogged down by torrential rains and the lack of communication with his corps commanders, Rosecrans plans of rapid movements and feints worked masterfully. Bragg, turned inside out by the federal deception and quick capture of Hoover's and Liberty's Gap, ev evacuated Manchester and subsequently Tullahoma by June 30th. With the federal ca uh, cavalry and infantry in hot pursuit, Bragg crossed the Elk River towards Chattanooga. The campaign ended on July 4th. And there's a w really wonderful uh, map of the Tullahoma campaign. Truly one of the most brilliant campaign of the Civil War. Three days later, on July 7th, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton composed this m message to Rosecrans, who made his temporary headquarters at Tullahoma. And listen to this. We have just received the official information that Vicksburg surrendered to General Grant on the 4th of July. Lee's army overthrown. Grant victorious. You and your noble army now have the chance to give the finishing blow to the rebellion. Will you neglect that chance or the chance? Boom, right? William Stark Rosecrans was not one to allow a perceived slight or insult to go unchallenged, even if that remark came from the Secretary of War. His reply was direct and defiant and demonstrated Rosecrans' tenuous relationship with the War Department. And I want you to listen to this closely, folks. 
Just received your cheering dispatch announcing the fall of Vicksburg and confirming the, the defeat of Lee. You do not appear to observe the fact that this noble army has driven the rebels from Middle Tennessee, of which my dispatches have advised you. I beg in behalf of, of this army that the War Department may not overlook so great an event because it was not written in the letters of blood. Boom, back to you, War Department. Indeed, I have now to repeat that the rebel army has been forced from its strong entrenched positions at Shelbyville and Tullahoma and driven over the Cumberland Mountains. My infantry advance is within 16 miles and my cavalry uh, advance within eight miles of the An Alabama line. No organized rebel force within 25 miles of there nor on this side of the Cumberland Mountains. There's the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. And I want to give a little bit more context here. So Rosecrans' response, though lacking tact, was justified. In his after-action report submitted uh, to the War Department on July 4th, he gleamed with pride. Thus ended a nine days campaign, which drove the enemy from two fortified position, positions and gave us possession of Middle Tennessee, conducted in the, one of the most extraordinary rains ever known in Tennessee, at that period of the year over a soil that becomes almost the quicksand. And although nature provided the army from gaining the possession of the enemy's communications and forcing a major decisive battle, the results, and this is what Rosecrans writes, were far more successful than anticipated and could only have been obtained by a surprise as to that direction and force of our movement. He did this campaign at the loss of about three to 400 men. Absolutely spectacular. So from Tullahoma, Rosecrans sought to prolong the momentum inspired by the recent federal victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg by advancing to capture Chattanooga. By surging towards Georgia, Rosecrans could defeat the fleeing Confederate Army in force and threaten the state capital and major transportation center, Atlanta. I guess it wasn't really the state capital at that point, but the major transportation center at Atlanta. Prior to launching his campaign towards Chattanooga, Rosecrans cabled Burnside, who was to advance the Army of the Ohio in conjunction with the Army of the Cumberland. But there was a major issue. Burnside was missing half of his army. So General Burnside officially assumed command of the Department of the Ohio on March 25, 1863, and made his temporary headquarters in Cincinnati. As I mentioned before, duty, uh, Burnside's duties were complicated and, and immense, and he lacked the necessary troops to manage his expansive department. He was tasked with three major objectives, forming a protective barrier against Confederate raids into southern and central Kentucky, recruiting troops, and organizing a federal offensive to liberate East Tennessee in coordination with the Army of the Cumberland's movement into southern Tennessee towards Chattanooga. It was a massive undertaking. A movement into barren East Tennessee required thousands of draft animals and tons of supplies. So a camp of instruction and I call a Ford operating uh, supply depot was required. So on April 26, 1863, General Burnside issued Special Orders Number 141, Major James H. Simpson, Chief Engineer, and Captain John H. Dickerson, Chief uh, Quartermaster, were instructed to proceed to some point in Kentucky beyond Nicholasville for the purpose of selecting a site for a, a depot of military supplies for troops operating in that vicinity. So a site was selected on defensible ground between a bend of the Kentucky River and Hickman Creek, 18 miles south of Lexington, Kentucky, on the Lexington-Danville Turnpike, uh, renamed Camp Nelson or named Camp Nelson in June of 1863. So Burnside's Army of the Ohio consisted, believe it or not, of the 1st and 2nd Division of the 9th Corps, who were transferred from the Army of the Potomac with Burnside in March of 1863. To further supplement his force, the War Department authorized the organization of the 23rd Army Corps that consisted of all troops in Kentucky not belonging to the 9th Army Corps. Major General George L. Hartsuff, a battle-scarred veteran, was assigned command uh, to the new Army Corps. So the Army Depot grew rapidly that summer. And here's a wonderful map of Camp Nelson. So according to a U.S. soldier, 
who wrote, this camp is a regularly, uh, regularly organized institution. Transportation could be readily obtained being only four miles from Nicholasville. It's about six, actually. Therefore, we can get supplies in any quantity. We shall be content to remain here for a long time. He also mentions a line of earthworks is being extended on the north side from one stream to the other a mile long. The distance by the pike from these works to the southern point or toe of these horseshoes is two miles. The space included and called by the general name of Camp Nelson cannot be less than 2,000 acres. He, he goes on to write 25 buildings of oak material throughout and of the average size of 40 by 100 feet have already been erected and others are in, pro are, are in progress. One of these is a blacksmith shop, another a wagon makers, and the rest are for forage, commissary, and quartermaster stores. It is enough to bewilder an, or an ordinary mortal even to look at the quantities of everything already here. I counted 200 boxes of horseshoe nails, holding perhaps a bushel apiece. A bakery containing three ovens in con is constantly turning out the finest kind of bread. A never-failing <coughs> spring from which a runs a stream as big as a man's arm supplies to place with water. A reservoir of, of the capacity of 4,000 barrels is, ne is nearly complete. Of solid masonry, which will be kept full, and from which the water will be hauled to various places wherever it is wanted. And I'll conclude his thoughts with this. Roads and streets are being laid out and constructed. Canals and yards are made. The underbrush of force is cl uh, cleaned up to give the range of s for stock. Baggage wagons by the score, each drawn by six mules, are constantly arriving and leaving. Infantry, cavalry, and batteries are drilling and maneuvering. So let me explain this map to you real quick. I'll speak here. So to the left is the Kentucky River. You can see the bend of the Kentucky River to the west. To the east, you can see the stream there. It's called Hickman Creek. So Camp Nelson, this massive military supply depot, is defended on two sides, to the west and the south, uh, excuse me, to the east. Uh, to the top, you can see a system of fortification that was constructed to protect the camp uh, from the northern approach of the enemy. Uh, and to the south, actually, the, um, the Kentucky River crosses east-west to protect the southern approach to the camp as well. And all along that road there is the Lexington-Danville Turnpike, and that's where the majority of the camp will be constructed. Uh, think about it as a military supply depot. And let me mention here, so Camp Nelson grew, to believe it or not, to encompass over 4,000 acres and featured 300 wooden, uh, 300 wooden buildings, including 20 commissary warehouses, two ordnance warehouses, a large ammunition and powder magazine, barns to store grain and feed, stables and crowds for animals, a machine shop, a sawmill, mess houses, offices, and living quarters for between three to 10,000 soldiers and 1,000 civilian employees. And as you saw before, you can see this date here in the aftermath of Gettysburg and Chancellorsville, I'm um, excuse, Gettysburg and Vicksburg, and then uh, Tullahoma. This is Halleck to Rosecrans, that you read, the general in chief. General Burnside has been frequently urged to move forward and cover your left by entering East Tennessee. And we'll dive into that in a second here. And there's Major General George Hartsuff, who commands the 23rd Army Corps. So at this point in 1863, the Army of the Ohio will consist of the 9th and 23rd Army Corps. And one of my favorite quotes, this gets back to that soldier's description of the camp. And look at the date there, July, late July of 1863, the appearance of things at Camp Nelson resembles that of an incipient city, a buzz of swirl and activity. And so these are some of the wagon shops and depots. We're fortunate that a photographer captured about 40 images of the camp during the Civil War. There's the large bakery. And if you look to the right on the building, it says fresh army bread. One of the encampments. Think about the amount of space that was occupied, 4,000 acres. And these are some of the harness and horse shops. Think about there were thousands of civilian employees that were employed here. 
And this was literally built beginning in the summer of 1863. And by the end of the war, there were 300 wooden buildings at Camp Nelson. A massive undertaking. And believe it or not, there was a waterworks. So the base featured waterworks consisting of 19,200 feet of lead pipe that carried water from the 500,000 gallon reservoir to various points across the camp. A steam powered pumping station, which you can see on the screen there, located at the base of the Kentucky River supplied the energy for this machinery, carrying 150 gallons per minute up 475 feet of the, wood, uh, of the uh, palisades over to the river bluff to a reservoir along with providing the camp's inhabitants with a supply of water work, uh, water, excuse me, the water works allowed for several important safety amenities, such as fire hoses at each warehouse. So this was really done for more fire suppression than anything. And look at that reservoir. And this was at the soldier's home. And you can see, uh, and really the, the courthouse of this structure, there is a fountain. So the water was distributed through lead pipes throughout the camp, and there, they even featured fountains for some of the buildings. So by June of 1863, Burnside was planning to put the East Tennessee campaign into motion, a campaign that Lincoln and Andrew Johnson been, had been waiting for and had, uh, vouching for, for since 1861. But the dire need for troops elsewhere thwarted and delayed his offensive, Birdside planned to launch his offensive from East Tennessee uh, with two corps from the Army, uh, as I said, two corps Army from Camp Nelson in late June or early July. But before he could concentrate his troops for a general advance, half of his army was sent further west. On June 3rd, General in Chief Henry Halleck ordered Burnside, and he said this, you must hurry forward reinforcements to General Grant. Where was General Grant in June of 1863? As we know, he was in Vicksburg. So Burnside responded uh, to Halleck from Cincinnati on June 3rd. And this is what he writes. Listen to this closely. Your dispatch received. Rosecrans is now re relying upon my advance in Tennessee, and I am all ready. If I do not go there, some eight to 10,000 men might be spared from gr for, for Grant. General uh, Rosecrans has telegraphed me that he is moving and wants me to push on. I leave for Hickman Creek, which is later named, or Hickman Bridge, uh, later named Camp Nelson at daylight tomorrow. Telegraph me at Lexington. And Burnside also writes to Rosecrans. General uh, Halleck has asked me how many troops I can send to Grant, and I am expecting orders that will interfere with the East Tennessee movements. We'll telegraph you. I leave this morning for Lexington. Telegraph me there. This gets better and better, by the way. Halleck's response to Burnside. You will immediately dispatch 8,000 men to General Grant at Vicksburg. Should it be found that General Grant will not require them, they will be stopped by the way or return to you as early as possible. Concentrate your remaining force as much as you can. I think there is no fear of, of an advance upon Kentucky at present. And this is my favorite aspect of this dialogue, right? This like telephone conversation through a telegraph. And this is what Burnside responded to Halleck. The two divisions of the Ninth Corps go. Shall I go with them? Hartsuff is concentrating the troops and can look about for matters here, and I will have nothing to do. I may be able to help Grant. Think about that in 1864, right? <laughs> and this is kind of like the cherry on top. Halleck's response to Burnside on June 4th, it will be obviously improper for you to leave your department to accompany a temporary detachment of less than one quarter of your effective force. Moreover, the, or the organization of the Kentucky militia requires your immediate attention. Boom. Burn. So Burnside was not very happy with that, as you can imagine. So in the meantime, he'll remain in uh, his headquarters in Cincinnati. Uh, and during that absence of the Ninth Corps, he'll impatiently awaiting their return before he can make his advance uh, through Kentucky into Tennessee. The Ninth Corps uh, reappeared in August 1863 as Burnside made his appearance at Camp Nelson. So I call this East Tennessee or bust. So 
Uh, Central Kentucky was bustling with activity in August of 1863 as Burnside and the Army of Ohio prepared for their grand offensive into East Tennessee. Uh, Camp Nelson served as the launching off point for the advance. Over the course of a couple weeks, the first two weeks of August of 1863, 25,000 men, thousands of horses and draft animals, and hundreds of wagons passed through the supply deep, uh, depot on their way south into the volunteer state. So Burnside actually arrives to Camp Nelson on August 11th. He's going to make his temporary headquarters at Cliff's Cottage at Polly's Bend, which is just northwest of Camp Nelson. Uh, the, Olive, uh, the Oliver Perry or White House served as Hartsuff's headquarters prior to the campaign. Uh, the White House is the only surviving structure at Camp Nelson from the Civil War period. It was constructed in 1856. The Army of the Ohio mass supplies, ordnance, forage, and animals at Camp Nelson for their arduous march into East Tennessee. On August 14th, Burnside issued General Field Orders Number 2 from the, uh, from the base, detailing the expectation for the Army during the campaign, especially their treatment of civilians and the protection of private property. The orders concluded, in quotes, with appropriate prayers for their protection, the uh, assistance of divine providence, and the Army departed from Camp Nelson two days later, August 16th, 1863. So there is the Oliver Perry House or the White House, which served as uh, Hartsuff's headquarters and later Army uh, officers' headquarters during the Civil War. And it's, as I mentioned, it's the only surviving structure we have at Camp Nelson from the period, and it's currently under renovation. So listen to this. The direct route from Camp Nelson to Knoxville, really the primary target of the campaign, r ran through Cumberland Gap. But the defensible uh, pass uh, through the Cumberland Mountains was held by Confederate forces. Rather than attack Cumberland Gap um, in his movement south, Burnside and chose, excuse me, Burnside and uh, instead chose to flank the position. And the Army of the Ohio was divided into ma two major uh, marching columns, uh, one uh, led by Burnside, the other by Hartza. By the way, when the Ninth Corps was returned, uh, transferred back to Kentucky, they were not in a condition to embark on this campaign because of exposure down on the Mississippi River during the Vicksburg campaign. So for the majority of this campaign, they're gonna be doing rear echelon duty, uh, guarding Burnside supply uh, trains that are headed into East Tennessee. Uh, despite supply problems in the rugged mountain terrain and poor road conditions, uh, the Army's offensive into East Tennessee proceeded uh, rapidly. And on September 2nd, uh, 2nd the Army of the Ohio entered Knoxville and captured the city without a fight. Uh, Confederate forces had been mostly withdrawn from the area due to the Chickamauga campaign that was evolving to the southeast. Uh, there were some skirmishes near Knoxville, but uh, the majority of the campaign, as I said, was successful uh, with Burnside. Uh, and he mentioned that uh, great praise is due to the troops of the command for their patience, endurance, and courage during the movement. Uh, the 23rd Corps, as I mentioned, bore the brunt of the advance into East Tennessee and has proved itself, according to Burnside, one of the best um, in the service. <clears throat> and Brow um, Burnside was really proud to re um, um, report to Halleck that the Army occupied Knoxville and other important points uh, without a major fight. Uh, there was going to be a light action at Cumberland Gap. As I mentioned, there was some Confederate uh, troops garrisoning the pass there. And Burnside will send about uh, a few thousand men um, in that direction. And there will be an engagement where the Confederate garrison will surrender on September 9th. And it's important to understand this, will, this uh, region, East Tennessee, will remain in federal control for the remainder of the war. And there's an image of Knoxville, uh, we believe in 1864, across the Tennessee River. And there's the view of the Cumberland Gap, which is, um, includes a national, uh, national park site now, Cumberland Gap National Historical Park, and it features Civil War era earthworks and features uh, the Knoxville campaign as well. So let's go further south. On August 16th, the same day that Burnside's Army of the Ohio began their offensive from Camp Nelson, Rosecrans' army, rested, refit, and confident, advanced from their positions around Tullahoma to Chattanooga. Once again, Rosecrans used feints to sim simultaneously pin and flank Bragg, uh, Bragg's forces entrenched at Chag uh, Chattanooga. He crossed the Tennessee River above the city, 
Uh, in this way, he, became, he, became, he came behind the left flank of Bragg's force, and Bragg was left uh, with no other choice than to abandon the city and retreat towards Georgia. He did so on September 9th. He, truly, he fully retreated out of Tennessee. So the gateway to Georgia was open. Rosecans once again divided his army corps and surged into Georgia in pursuit of Bragg, who he believed was, in, was demoralized and in full retreat. And you can see that cable there. The same day that the Confederate forces surrendered at Cumberland Gap, Rosecrans cables uh, Lincoln saying Chattanooga is ours without a struggle and East Tennessee is free. This is Victory Summer 63, right? This momentum from Vicksburg and Gettysburg and Tullahoma and now East Tennessee and Chattanooga. Rosecrans, as aptly described by my graduate school mentor, reached into the well one too many times following the capture of Chattanooga. His army corps was separated by dozens of miles in rough terrain. And most importantly, Rosecrans appeared to be ignoring intelligence that Bragg was being heavily reinforced by fresh troops, including veterans of the Army of Northern Virginia. And there's Chattanooga, the important rail center, really the heart of operations in that region leading into uh, Georgia, but also into East Tennessee and beyond. And so Lee's old war horse, Lieutenant General James Longstreet, commanding an independent force consisting of the divisions of McClaws and Hood and a brigade from Pickett's division and a 26-gun artillery battalion were transferred from the Army of the Northern Virginia beginning on September 5th and traveled over 16 railroads on a 775-mile uh, route through the Carolinas to reach Bragg in Northern Virginia. And the resulting Battle of Chickamauga thwarted Rosecrans' grand uh, march into Georgia. His defeated army retreated towards Chattanooga and was followed by Bragg, who laid siege. In response, we get the Battle of Ch uh, Chickamauga there, which I will not be covering in detail here. And there is James Longstreet, who spearheads a massive assault, which breaks the uh, federal line. In response, the U.S. War Department transferred... The 11th and 12th Corps from the Army of the Potomac on September 24th to Tennessee to reinforce Rosecrans and help lift the siege. As I mentioned, the details of the siege of Chattanooga will not be covered in this presentation, uh, but I think it's important that we return to East Tennessee and Ambrose Burnside, who will meet a familiar foe in James Longstreet. So after successfully liberating East Tennessee, the U.S. Army of the Ohio under General Burnside was tasked with occupying the region and supplying, uh, ex excuse me, establishing a supply depot from Camp Nelson through the Cumberland Gap into East Tennessee and obviously coordinating with other federal field forces in the f um, that were out uh, campaigning, especially the Army of the Cumberland following um, the capture of Chattanooga and Rosecrans' advance into Georgia. As I mentioned, Rosecrans' offensive into Georgia was repulsed at Chickamauga and resulted in the Confederate siege of Chattanooga in the subsequent month of November. So this is important to understand as well. Burnside's attempt to construct a supply route from central Kentucky to Knoxville was abandoned due to the rocky, unforgiving terrain. The planned junction between Burnside and Rosecrans did not materialize after uh, the armies of the Cumberland's defeat at the Battle of Chickamauga. And as the Confederate Army lays siege to Rosecrans, a detachment under uh, Longstreet was uh, directed north to de defeat Burnside and recapture Knoxville. So the new stage of the campaign commenced with marching as both Burnside and Longstreet's men uh, moved on parallel routes from Campbell Station, a vital crossroads leading to Knoxville. Each commander sought to reach Campbell Station before their opponent with Burnside hoping to withdraw to the safety of the def federal defenses at Knoxville, uh, which were constructed or adapted from Confederate earthworks. And Lee, uh, Longstreet was hoping to draw Burnside out into the open to defeat him uh, in open combat. And uh, November 16, 1863, Burnside's army arrived at Campbell Station and deployed to fight a delaying action shortly before the Confederates reached the crossroads. Longstreet launched an, an attack on Burnside, uh, but the Army of the Ohio successfully resisted, and the Confederate assault and um, 
resisted the Confederate assault and executed a withdrawal, uh, excuse me, a withdrawal in the direction of Knoxville. Uh, Burnside's forces were soon resumed their movement to Knoxville, to Knoxville, and by November 17th, most of Burnside's army was within the city's defensive line, which was protected by a system of earthen fortification. So there's going to be some skirmishes and battles that will take place around Knoxville um, throughout the remainder of the month here, including a major battle that took place at Fort Sanders, where Burnside's defenders were able to repulse Burns, uh, Longstreet's attacking um, infantry columns. Uh, according to Burnside, the troops were placed in position, entrenchments thrown up, um, and they were, th his soldiers gave a good account of themselves. So I'm going to move towards the conclusion here, folks. Victory summer 1863 ended with the Rosecrans defeat at Chickamauga and the inability of Rosecrans to forge an effective transportation route from central Kentucky into East Tennessee and points further south. The summer campaigns that began with the victories at Gettysburg, Vicksburg, and Tullahoma inspired hope and confidence that one final push would crush the rebellion and end the war. Events proved otherwise. Stubborn resistance, by, uh, stubborn resistance by Confederate forces in the Western Theater, including the timely transfer from tr uh, of troops from Virginia to Georgia, helped stem the tide. Also, the Army of the Potomac struggles to bring on a major engagement in the late summer and fall of 1863 led to major changes in the spring of 1864. So victory summer 1863, while ultimately unsuccessful in ending the war, produced major results for the U.S. military for 1864 and beyond to the end of the war. So mid uh, Middle Tennessee was cleared of any major enemy force. Chattanooga was ultimately secured and served as Sherman's base of operations when he launched the Atlanta campaign in the spring of 1864. And East Tennessee was liberated and remained in federal control for the remainder of the conflict. But what about Camp Nelson? I call this the great task remaining. On March 17, 1864, Ulysses S. Grant formally accepted command uh, or the command um, of the General-in-Chief commanding armies of the United States. That very same day, March 17, 1864, he sent a message to Major General John Schofield, who had replaced Burnside as commander of the Army of the Ohio. And this is what he said. I have, an, I have had an inspection made of Camp Nelson and Mount Sterling. It shows a wasteful extravagance there, and also the points are badly selected. It seems to me that Camp Nelson should be broken up entirely and the public property issued where it will be of service. So Camp Nelson's fate appeared sealed, but the army base endured. It evolved in, in accordance with the war's dramatic shifts and changes. So the great task remaining for the war for the Union at last included the destruction of slavery in Kentucky and the, order, and the other border states. A full year after the War Department organized the Bureau of Colored Troops, the U.S. Army at last authorized the recruitment of African-American men, African men for military service in Kentucky. Camp Nelson became, one of the lar became the largest recruitment and training base for African-American men in the state. Eight full regiments, United States Colored Troops, numbering over 10,000 men were organized at Camp Nelson. It was the large, third largest recruiting post for USCT soldiers in the entire country. Listen to this. Two of the regiments were transferred to the Eastern Theater and served with the Army of the James around Richmond and Petersburg. One uh, regiment participated in the Appomattox campaign and were present at Lee's surrender on April 9, 1865. One of the units that was organized, the 12th United States Colored Heavy Artillery, so there were four infantry regiments, two cavalry regiments, and two heavy artillery regiments. The one image that we have of African-American soldiers at Camp Nelson, this is one of the barracks. It's either the 5th or 6th U.S. Colored Cavalry. These are some of the soldiers recruited at Camp Nelson. It's important 
critically important to understand that the majority of men that enlisted at Camp Nelson were enslaved, and they self-emancipated by enlisting at Camp Nelson. So in a span of a year, enslaved African-American men self-emancipated by enlisting with the U.S. Army or in the U.S. Army. They were, re were, re were reviewed at pres uh, by President Abraham Lincoln, and there their baptism by fire at the campaigns around Richmond and Petersburg, and were even present at the surrender of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox. There were 20, about 24,000 African-American men that enlisted in the U.S. military in Kentucky. including the 107th out of Louisville. And, uh, this is in the defenses of Washington in 1865. And I think a lot of people have seen this image. For years, it was um, labeled as a uh, unidentified USCT soldier and his family. We now know this is uh, Samuel Smith of the 119th United States Colored Infantry, his wife and two daughters. He enlisted at Camp Nelson. So let me conclude here, folks. Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Tullahoma, Knoxville, and Chattanooga contributed to forging a new birth of freedom. Thank you so much. And I wanted to share real quickly, because I know I'm, I'm out of time here, that when the men came to Camp Nelson, including men that were impressed by the U.S. Army in 1863 to build the, the defenses of Camp Nelson. They were impressed by the Army, the, and the, the federal government paid the enslavers or the slaveholders for their service. Uh, we have identified about 100 men that later came back and enlisted in the U.S. military. They were also joined by their family. Thousands of women and children and men unfit for military service came to Camp Nelson and became war refugees. The federal government had no policy for war refugees, especially in the border states. And unfortunately, uh, there were multiple uh, instances where the army literally drove these refugees out of camp. We call them expulsions. Uh, the worst incident happening in November of 1864 were 400 refugees including men and women, and family members of U.S. colored troops were driven out of Camp Nelson during the midst of a winter storm, and over 100 of them died as a result. So you can see here, we honored them this past November, about 102, and the other refugees that were expelled, about eight expulsions that we have identified. Um, but through this tragedy, this led to lasting change because... In November, uh, excuse me, in January of 1865, uh, the War Department and the federal government authorized the establishment of the Home for Colored Refugees at Camp Nelson. And you can see it here, which grew exponentially to support thousands of formerly enslaved men and women and children. And you can see it goes from these wooden structures to tents to even shacks at the bottom left. Uh, in March of 1865, Congress at last authorizes a bill or legislation that emancipates the families of black soldiers. And I'll conclude by saying this. It's important to understand that there were still enslaved people in Kentucky and Delaware uh, in June of 1865, long after Juneteenth Day. Um, it was not until December 6, 1865, with the ratification of the 13th Amendment, did slavery end in Kentucky and Delaware and Kentucky did not ratify the 13th Amendment until 1975. So from enslaved to soldier to freedom, and in the years after the Civil War, to citizenship. And please follow us. As I mentioned, we're one of the newest units of the National Park Service. That's our website, our social media pages, and um, of course, there's my email address. I'd love to hear from any of you with questions or comments. And if you happen to make it out to Camp Nelson, we'd love to show you around. So thank you so much. Steve, thank you again one last time. And I would encourage everyone to be back here at 4 o'clock for the last outdoor presentation of the day. That will be Wayne Motts talking about Gettysburg to the Titanic. So back here at 4. Thank you all. Thank you.